I know some of you, but not all of you. Um, and so I just want to say how um, happy and thrilled we are to have you all here today to talk about energy and technology and transition. Um, we are grateful to all of our partners who have worked with us to make this happen. Please give a special thank you to Krista Schneider for all of her work in putting this together and to our engineering faculty and working side by side with her. So I'm going to pause and say I don't have much more to say than that, Krista. Okay. Except welcome, and we're really glad you're here this afternoon. I hope it's a fruitful conversation. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you to Dr. Wright and all of Prince Hazelton for hosting this event. Not only this event, but me as well. I am, let me uh, close this here. I am the technical advisor for PEMTAP, and I'm going to go ahead and hope that this presentation started. Hold on. Sharon, you can go ahead and turn your um, camera back on, if possible. It should be on. Sharon, okay, yep. Uh, Sharon's coming. Yep. So we have four speakers today. We have two here <laughs> in person, and then we have two virtual. Uh, Aaron Patrick and Sharon Pillar are, are joining us from other regions of the state, or I think Aaron might he might be in New York. I heard you say so. I want to thank every I want to thank them and uh, you know the other speakers for uh, agreeing to to join us today. And you know it's it's time, it's commitment, and so I, I really do appreciate everybody um, participating in this event and, and all all of you, of course, who come out today. Um, my name is Krista Schneider, and I'm gonna hope I'm gonna try again to start this slide. I, uh, I'm, I'm a technical advisor for PENTAP. PENTAP is the Pennsylvania Technical Assistance Program at Penn State. And we are a uh, state funded, uh, I should say, a, a grant funded statewide organization. Um, we, call it, we cover all regions of the state. Um, and we fall within the Office of the um, Office of Industry Partnerships under the research arm of the university. And so our job basically is to connect the, the resources of the university with small business and industry, mostly small to medium sized manufacturers. And so that's been um, my role. Uh, I serve all of Northeast PA, see my section there, number three. And I have several colleagues that work elsewhere throughout the region. Thanks to Penn State Hazleton for hosting me. I have my office here, uh, but I also work closely with Penn State Wilkes Barre and Scranton and all the economic development partners. and. Uh, and industries in the region. So our, our, like I said, our mission is basically to, to assist businesses um, become more sustainable. And uh, we do that by uh, following the United Nations Sustainability Goals, which are, uh, those are goals also that have been adopted by the university. And, um, you know, we, we, we go out into, into local manufacturers, we, we work with small businesses, startups, et cetera. We try to really, help them uh, not only conserve energy, which is a key function uh, of our job, but we also help to, um, to um, make them more innovative. And how, how do we do that? Um, so I don't know how to move this around that you can see, but so we have, we have two areas of focus. Um, the first, like I said, is energy and environment. We actually go out into the local manufacturers and work with them and do low hanging fruit. You know, I don't have the expertise that a lot of you all have in, in this room when it comes to, um, you know, the, the higher, higher, um, uh, you know, utility, uh, you know, purchasing agreements and stuff like that. We don't do that. We, we work with, with small businesses and manufacturers, like I said, to really try to identify low, low hanging fruit. What are some um, the, the, the easiest ways for them to save energy? Um, we do that through, um, you know, energy efficiency assessments. We also work with them on, on training programs. 
Um, we're actually just starting a another cohort um, energy management system. So it's more of a holistic approach. The DOE program, we, we, we're looking to enroll actively for that. So if you know of any, you know, businesses that are looking to, to develop an energy management approach uh, to their, uh, for their facilities, you know, we can work with them on that and it's free. Uh, it's a, it's a 50,001 ready program. Uh, so, so we do a lot of those services and then we also um, work directly with trying to connect them with um, faculty, with uh, the research centers at University Park, um, a lot of the um, funding programs that we have support that effort. And, uh, you know, we, we try to match, match students up for capstone projects and, and so forth. Um, so what does, what does that have to do with why we're here today? Well, so when we go out, one of the things that I've learned in the past year, and I've only been in this position maybe a little over a year, but one of the things that I've learned is that, you know, with increased energy costs, um, you know, the businesses are really struggling to, to figure out how to save energy. And, and a lot of times, even just the low-hanging fruit is not, is not enough. So they are looking to renewables. They're interested in renewables, especially solar. You know, that's the biggest um, interest right now. And, and we're not really able to help them with solar, per se. I mean, we're not certified, um, you know, uh, to, do, to do that. Um, so what we'll do is we'll refer them to the Pennsylvania Solar Center, which is why I invited Sharon uh, Pillar to, to join the conversation today. Um, but what I do know is that even, even with their interest, um, there's a, a bunch of obstacles um, to start thinking about transitioning to renewables or just adding renewables to their portfolio. Um, one is, you know, just site, site constraints. Um, the building infrastructure is not able to say to support the, you know, roof panels. Uh, the site is just too small. There's not a plan. And they just don't, and a lot of us, you know, it's just, a, it's a complex um, undertaking and people just don't have the, the technical skills or training to understand what all goes into a feasibility assessment for um, determining if, if solar is a, or any sort of renewable um, option uh, is available for, for their needs. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is uh, because we are so tied in to the research um, agenda, the priorities, the research centers at Penn State, I know that there is a, a ton of emphasis and funding and resources that are going into uh, developing new technologies, research development of sustainable energy or renewable energy. And so um, I want to show this picture because I was able to accompany Dr. Rinaldi up it's hidden behind the, the camera. Um, <laughs> I was able to accompany Dr. Rinaldi and some of the students uh, last ice was late last year. We went um, to visit Little Lee Farms together, and uh, just to understand the direction of corporate um, sustainability goals and where they're moving. I mean, Little Lee Farms, of course, is an indoor um, under glass, uh, you know, indoor agriculture facility. So their their needs are a little unique. But a, a lot of the industries that I'm visiting especially the larger ones that have a global footprint or, you know, uh, customers that are global, uh, they're looking for ways to meet, you know, their customers' needs for the sustainability and greenhouse gas reduction. And as part of the supply chain, they need to be figuring out how to reduce their uh, carbon footprint. And so it's, it's just this very, you know, wicked problem. Um, to to think about how, how you know how these things fit together, the um, the other thing that I'm you know involved with um, being here in the region and having you know spent many years uh, working with community organizations, understanding the economic development goals and trends here. Um, in fact, this picture was taken back in June. Many of you that are here in the room are actually here for that. It was a workshop that we hosted on um, just trying to understand the the regional growth that is planned to occur here in the, in the Hazleton area, but along the I-81 corridor in general. Uh, there is more than, I believe about 30 million square feet 
um, a planned or permitted industrial space uh, for right here in the Hazleton area. You know, you can see the, the colored maps for the different parcels that have been identified for, for new industrial development, the manufacturing, manufacturing, and or it's just it's spec, you know, spec development. Uh, that's not including the 30 million, another um, 30 million that is to be uh, developed up in uh, Wilkes Barre Scranton area, and another 10 million that's projected to be developed um, south of here in Schuylkill County. So together, that's about 70 million, it, you know, give or take. So that's a lot. And, you know, with the companies or the manufacturers that I work with, assuming that the average uh, electricity consumption is anywhere from like 50 to 80 kilowatt hours per square foot per year, if you times that by 30 million square feet, and that's a, that's a ton of um, energy uh, that's going to be needed over the next you know few years as the region develops. And so the question in the back of my mind is, you know, what can I do as you know through Pentap through um, through the resources that we have to just bring attention to this to get people to start talking about it. Um, you know, there is a, a comprehensive plan that is begun um, for the municipal the local municipalities here. How could perhaps energy um, supply and distribution be part of that conversation? You know, should it be? And if so, you know, what what are some things that need to be considered and and who should who's the right who are the right people to reach out to, to to help inform that conversation. So that's why I I invited all these smart people today to um, to this forum uh, to talk about this. And this is actually just one of the series of uh, is the first of three forums that I'm hosting. Uh, one at each campus. The second forum is actually going to be focused on the um, semiconductor industry and the chips act. And that will be held at Penn State Wolf's Fair on April 28th. So you're all invited to, to attend that as well. And then the third forum will, will plan in the fall up at Penn State Strand. But it's all about trying to connect technology that's being developed in Penn State in the local community to meet economic development um, needs and or industry needs. And so that's that's what this is all about today. And that's why um, that's why that's why I thought, you know, let me invite. And, uh, and and you all and have this conversation. So without any further delay, um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our our speakers. We have four, as I said. Um, I'll, I'll start with Michael because he's going to go first. So Michael Leibowitz, uh, he plays an, an active role in business development at uh, Romark Logistics. Um, he works in not only you know business development but also operations, real estate. Um, he focuses on sales marketing, operations management, market evaluations, procurement, development, and construction and leasing of real estate assets, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, Romark has extensive green initiatives that include a two megawatt solar rooftop array uh, at their facility here at Humboldt, and I'll talk about that as well. And that's, that's why I wanted to you know, invite them because of their investment in that um, infrastructure. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Science in uh, Business Management and Master of Business Administration from Wagner College. And uh, he and his family are str uh, strong supporters of Penn State, and they've generously contributed to the Romark Logistics Open Door Scholarship Program here at Penn State Hazleton. So thank you. Um, Aaron Patrick, he's, he's joining us virtually. He's the Director of Research and Development for the PPL Corporation. Uh, he focuses his work there on developing solar, renewable energy integration, battery energy storage, carbon capture, green hydrogen, and electrical vehicle technology. And uh, he works extensively with external research partners, uh, you know, spanning universities, private corporations, and nonprofits. Um, pr prior to uh, assuming uh, this role, he worked for the Louisville Gas and Electric Company and the Kentucky Utilities Company as manager of their technology transfer program with the Electric Power Research Institute. So tons, tons of experience there uh, in R&D. And prior to that, he actually served as the assistant director for the Kentucky Department of Energy. So um, he has a lot of experience, uh, previous work also in the federal government, and he's a proud 
graduate of the University of Kentucky, where he received his uh, master's degree in diplomacy and international commerce. So very accomplished um, gentleman there. Sharon uh, Pillar is, is uh, also joining virtually. She's uh, based out of Pittsburgh. Uh, she's the executive director of the Pennsylvania Solar Center. That's a nonprofit organization that she founded in 2018. Uh, because she felt that the state was not real, realizing its full potential for uh, clean energy. And she wanted to address the gap um, of information and kind of organizing activity around that industry. Uh, she also owns her own private consultancy. It's called the Hot Earth Collaborative, which she founded in 2013 to advance clean energy markets. And her prior experience, uh, you know, it's very extensive, but she, uh, she worked for a, a period of time for uh, Penn Future, uh, that's the Citizens, uh, Citizens for Pennsylvania Future, uh, that's a statewide energy advocacy organization, and, and there she had a lot of experience working to create uh, models, solar zoning ordinances, and uh, permitting practices, and also uh, financing options for 24 municipalities in, um, in Western PA. And I, I thought it was very important also, uh, she was appointed last year by Governor Shapiro to serve on his transition team as a member of the Energy Subcommittee, and she's going to be helping guide the uh, administration um, on their energy policy. Uh, she holds a, a master's degree from St. Mary's of Rhodes College in Terre Haute, Indiana, if I pronounce that right, and her bachelor's in psychology from Mansfield State University. And last but not least, um, you probably, uh, many of you here know Dr. Joe Rinaldi. He is an associate professor of engineering uh, here and uh, the discipline coordinator for engineering at the University College. He teaches classes in renewable energy engineering and he uh, formerly served as the, the program coordinator. He received uh, a, the new faculty fellow award from the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers in 2013 and prior to joining Penn State. He worked for the uh, National Energy Technology Laboratory at the uh, U.S. Department of Energy in, in West Virginia. And he received his PhD in mechanical engineering from Virginia Tech. And he's also a Penn State graduate, uh, undergraduate. So that's our panel. Um, I'm going to let them take over and I'm going to stop talking. Uh, I think, you know, We'll hold questions until the end. I'll try to facilitate. I'll have a few of my own, but you know, I hope everybody here could just, you know, ask um, ask the questions. The folks joining virtually will be available as well, and uh, then there's a reception that will start um, right 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 around four o'clock. So please stick around and enjoy the food sponsored by Romark Logistics. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I guess Michael, do you want to go ahead and get started? Want, want me to work your slides or are you going to come up here? Sure. I'll All right, well, it's, it's nice to see everybody in, in person at Penn State. Uh, so the weather is not as great today, but uh, certainly happy to be here uh, in New Jersey. Uh, my name is Michael Levitz, as introduced on the Walmart Logistics uh, in our business development function. Uh, our company, our company has, uh, has been around for approximately 70 years. Uh, we founded in the state of New Jersey uh, as a trucking company uh, back in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, we went into a warehouse, uh, warehousing company that has years uh, progressed. And consumer demands and manufacturing shipments uh, change the habits and patterns. Um, you know, we were built around the United States. We operate about 30 locations uh, northeast, southeast, southwest, and west coast, uh, predominantly warehousing distribution, fulfillment, and transportation, uh, as well as a real estate run. It's a separate from the company uh, to develop the best in class facilities throughout the United States. Uh, a little bit about our mission. Uh, and vision, we can keep going through. Uh, these are some of the core logistic services that we offer uh, to our clients. 
as stated, warehousing and distribution, e commerce, transportation, co packing, uh, consulting, startup management, tenant management, real estate development uh, throughout the United States. So, what does sustainability mean to you? Okay, this is an important topic. Uh, obviously, sustainability has been at uh, the forefront of the, of the need uh, for the world for a number of years now. And it's becoming more and more relevant each and every single day, both in our personal and professional lives. Uh, all these words that make up this chart are different areas in which people feel connected to sustainability, uh, whether it's energy, climate change, consumption, recycling, the economy, earth. Uh, you, you name it, there's a lot of different perspectives on what sustainability means. And as a company that operates uh, in Northeast Pennsylvania, in Hazel, St. Now, since 2003, uh, when we established ourselves in the uh, Northeast PA market, you know, sustainability has been something that not just we as a supply chain company uh, have had to uh, ingrain in the DNA of who we are and how we operate and act every single day, but it's also important to our customers and clients. And it's important to their clients who they will buy materials and goods throughout the world. Uh, so sustainability by definition is the ability to be maintained at a certain level of degree, but sustainability means a whole lot more than that in terms of how we operate ourselves each and every single day. I'm gonna go through just some general questions, you know, for how we think about sustainability in our business and questions that we ask of ourselves to make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable. Uh, you know, in our process, we look at procurement. What companies are you purchasing from uh, products from and services from? Do your products focus on sustainable service goods? How are these goods transported to you? And what purchase frequency is established and, and can this be optimized? For us, the procurement, the way that goods come to us and services come to us so that we can do our job effectively, that's just as important as once they hit your building and operation and you're using or consuming those goods. So for us, we need to be asking our suppliers, we need to be asking our vendors, how are you managing sustainability, right? What methods and procedures are you putting in place at your production facilities, your employees, your key stakeholders? How are you holding yourselves accountable? Because we're buying products from you. We're delivering those products to our customers. And it's at the forefront of the mentality of how you're looking at bringing in, forgetting even going out to your customers. Right? It all starts from your buying and, and, and how you're aggregating goods and services into your business. Once it happens and, and it hits our operations, you know, we have to look at our business practices. In Walmart Logistics, we've looked at many things from how we operate ships, how we operate structure, how we build buildings, how we look at, you know, incentives for, you know, carpooling uh, based on zip code radiuses of employees, how we look at ship start time based on peak energy you know, grid consumption. We're looking at all of these different things once we're in our operations day by day to make sure that we're delivering a sustainable solution, not just for ourselves, but a mutual sustainable solution for the partners that we procure from and the customers that we're going to be shipping to. And finally, uh, on the shipping, you know, there's many things that are in our business in supply chain, logistics, and transportation that we're looking about optimizing the outbound order process to make sure that trucks, which are predominantly throughout the United States, still diesel power. How are we optimizing them to fill those trucks better, to have more queue, less frequent shipments, to ultimately drive down energy uh, uh, throughout the nation? Uh, we look at our shipping partners, uh, make sure that they're using sustainable efforts. Are we looking at, you know, rooftop solar on top of 53 foot Brian Reefer trailers? Are we looking at solar tracking? What efforts are they making? How do they hold themselves accountable each and every single day? Uh, and you know, the orders, as I mentioned, are they fully optimized? That's something that you have to work in partnership with your clients. I'm going to cover a couple of key areas, uh, and I've mentioned uh, you know some of the work that we did actually in partnership with, with Penn State uh, back in 2011. Uh, we, we have a 730,000 foot uh, warehouse and distribution center uh, here in Hazleton uh, that we built in 2003. Uh, the building started at about 530,000 feet. Uh, years later, as you know, energy considerations became more and more important to us and to our customers, 
uh, we decided uh, through uh, partnerships and through some grants uh, that it was time to invest, less time to invest heavily in solar. Uh, in 2011, we partnered with Penn State to look at some technical uh, support, underlighting, and uh, and engineering, as well as grant uh, reviews. Uh, and we were able to put in a two megawatt system on our rooftop uh, in Hazel Township, PA. Uh, it's 8,512 panels. Uh, to date, we still reduce the energy demand from the grid by about 40% per year. Uh, so there are significant savings. Yes, the financial part is important and, and that drives a lot of decisions in, in business and industry, but also they're doing, doing right. Doing right by our customers, doing right by our community. My family built this business on being very uh, community focused. Uh, we're, we're, we're a small big company or a big small company, however you want to look at it. But we determined that every single market that we operate in, the employees that come to work every single day, the schools that we support, the events, the institutions, the, the retailers, the restaurants, they're all part of, a, of an ecosystem of community. And we want to entrench ourselves in the DNA of that community because it's just as important to make sure that your family uh, business doing uh, doing right by, by all around you. Um, so this facility happened to benefit from uh, some great solar programs at the time. Again, the system is uh, still operating in full today. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a glass panel system. And I'll go over some of the design considerations that we take forth now in our strategy on industrial development to make sure that for ourselves and for our tenants and clients, that the buildings are built to be able to accommodate not just the weight and requirements of today, but for the future as well. Uh, outside of the four walls, you'll see a lot of different things at our facilities, right? LED lighting uh, on the exterior to provide, yes, a, a friendly and safe environment for our truckers and carrier partners, employees who are coming 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but also something that's Sustainable, something that's friendly, something that's not going to disrupt the community, uh, and, uh, and that we're going to be able to uh, we're going to be able to maintain. Uh, we'll also get into a little bit about uh, in our design uh, side of the business some of the electric charging for both cars and trucks. Uh, everybody focuses on cars these days. Trucks are coming, especially in the long haul transportation business, uh, and we need to be prepared from an infrastructure standpoint to be able to accommodate. Uh, those charges on the road and at distribution centers and delivery points throughout the, the country. Next, we're going to take you inside the four walls. Um, so, our perspective on, uh, on on inside, you know, we we take a look a holistic approach on sustainability, and in a sense, you have to really deconstruct your own perspective of the supply chain to make sure that your looking and analyzing every, at every single piece of your business. It's not just solar panels. It's not just LED lights. It's not just, you know, recycling programs, right? It goes, it goes very far and very deep. Uh, and, you know, here at Romark, we have a pretty robust system that takes many facility-oriented uh, items, many operationally-oriented items to be able to drive it. This highlights some of our facility programs that we put in place. Building automation systems are a critical point. Uh, they've been for the last probably about five years in terms of driving efficient solutions for buildings that are more controlled and custom tailored to actually aggregate and take in numerous systems, not just your lights on motion sensors, but times when the HVAC is coming on, times when the HVAC is coming off, sensors in the lighting programs, in the docks outside to be able to bring everything together from the data point so you can better analyze consumption uh, based on your hours of operation. LED lighting on motion sensors is a must. We're working uh, with uh, with our, our vendor partners. Uh, I'll go over one in particular, pest control. We're a high food grade uh, uh, distribution center here in Hazleton. We worked with our pest control operators to design and develop automated, uh, automated devices in our facility. Right. Historically, the mentality was a pest control technician would come out every week, every couple of weeks, inspect all the traps, give the reporting, see what's going on. Nowadays, we're able to put sensors inside of these devices where we can reduce the frequency that our vendors have to come on site, thus saving carbon emissions, and we're able to get real-time activity based on an actual need as opposed to just a set frequency that made sense for our business 10 years ago. 
right? So there's many ways that you can kind of dig deeper uh, in the supply chain and try and find energy efficiency and deliver a green solution. Uh, obviously, we're upgrading a lot of our electrical, natural gas, and water infrastructure to support the, the demand and the reduction. Uh, we're doing replacements of our facilities, slow flow, uh, you know, uh, toilets and urinals, you know, restroom facilities, uh, looking at everything from how we can give better charging opportunities for our employees and our equipment while delivering it in a safer manner. Um, we're also looking at, you know, Painting, right? Paint consumption is a big part of these rather large buildings. It's a big part of maintenance. We're looking at the design of paint now, and we've been for a number of years. High traffic, high touch areas. How can we go darker, more like the color of a shoe when it's going to kick a door? How can we look at the design fundamentals of paint to ensure that we're doing something that will last five, ten years? Not just two and need to be touched up, repainted. We're looking at this at the inside of our facilities. On the outside of our facilities, anywhere where trucks, tires, forklifts, anything is going to impact, we're going with darker shades that are able to be utilized longer in the facility and thus reduce our requirement to go to hazardous type paints, even though we're looking at greener solutions there as well. We want to try and eliminate it as best we can over the life cycle of our of property and development. Operationally green. Right, so these are a lot of things on here uh, that you've probably uh, seen or come to know uh, in the supply chain. Uh, you know, material handling equipment obviously has gone through a big conversion over the years from traditional lead acid uh, to lithium ion, hydrogen. There's there's many new alternative energies and advanced uh, battery energies that are out there now. We've converted most of our fleet to uh, lithium ion uh, at this point. We have smart uh, tracking systems and smart data systems built into our batteries so that we're able to better plan for downtime, shift changes, everything else to look at the performance, look at the utilization, look at the need, um, and, and make sure that we're ordering just enough for our operations, not carrying additional capacity uh, that we don't need. Deployment of electric yard trucks. Uh, this picture right here uh, are two yard trucks. Uh, we're one of the first. Uh, this is in the state of Texas. Uh, to deploy uh, electric uh, yard trucks in partnership with RNGD through the state of Texas. Uh, it was a, a turf, uh, in Texas Energy Production Program uh, that, that enabled that uh, acquisition and implementation in our operation. These trucks are able to reduce emissions drastically by tying into the energy grid, and these can even be bypassed into the uh, rooftop solar program for charging so pieces of equipment. Uh, every single one of our uh, transportation pieces of equipment throughout the nation have solar tracking on. We are no longer tying into, you know, batteries and, uh, and the electrical systems of trucks to, to get data. We're using data through solar tracking to be more efficient, be smarter, work with our drivers uh, around the country, make sure that we're looking at best performance of, of route optimization. We want to make sure that anything that we can do, whether in a gas powered vehicle or an electric vehicle, that they're delivering the goods to the customers and picking up to come back to our warehouses in the most optimal route to avoid as much emissions uh, as possible. Um, the, the next point is very important. And no matter whether you're in supply chain, uh, in the supply chain industry or not, optimization is really a key element uh, before you go invest in in anything, uh, you know, solar, lithium ion, uh, you know, electric car, right? How can you optimize the process of a business, right? And you have to look at it. Are we thinking just based on legacy mentality and how we've done things for a long time? How can we do things smarter? How can we do things better? How can we do things more efficiently without paying a penny to invest in a solution that's going to help you reduce, you know, demand and, and grid and consumption. We're really looking at ways to optimize our shifts. We're looking at ways to optimize our equipment so that we can do more with less. Um, the basic programs you know, on recycling, corrugated and plastic bailing, almost all of our facilities around the country uh, implemented those probably 10, 15 years ago. Uh, you know, as mentioned, we're working with smart designs for air conditioning. I'm not going to go through the entire list, but these are a lot of different areas uh, that we're looking at. Um, I'll highlight some special ones 
Uh, we're working with our partners now, and this is kind of a snapshot of what it looks like here to deploy autonomous drones inside of our facilities, which is very difficult based on the fact that most drones that are automated rely on GPS, which is not available inside the four walls of a building. So we're working with our partners to develop QR code strategies in very narrow aisle and high occupancy of foot traffic environments to be able to do inventories more regularly through drones, right? And the same amount that we're able to do in terms of counting pallets per hour, we're able to send drones up and do the same amount of work and probably just about fourfold the return on this, right? We're no longer sending scissor lifts that charging and big electric systems. We're having these small drones that are able to fly around the facility in a safe manner and do the same exact result for us with a lot less power consumption. So these are the types of things that we have to look at in our business. Um, you know, there's a lot of basics on this list. There's a lot of, you know, you know, advancements that maybe are not quite there in terms of industry, but we are partnering with our clients and we are partnering with industry uh, to explore any solution that we can. Green development is important. And I know you had mentioned before about all the development coming to uh, coming to Pennsylvania. Uh, we have through uh, Walmart Logistics and, and some of our affiliate partnerships, uh, we have about, I would say, 13 to 14 million square feet in our pipeline for development on the distant seaboard. Uh, it will be delivered over the next 18 to 24 months. Uh, and some projects in Texas as well that not included that cap. But in terms of what can be done to be more green, to be more sustainable, it starts with your civil design planning for facilities, the earth park, right? How can you move less dirt? How can you take into consideration sewer planning capacity, water capacity, utility capacity in a more environmentally uh, friendly way? based on the communities and based on all the demand that we're going to be seeing coming into the country, how can we, as a solutions provider, build a, a more friendly building for not just ourselves, but for our tenants and customers? So we're spending a lot of time on environmentally friendly designs. I think that clear story windows and natural light, we used to see a lot of, um, a lot of uh, rooftop uh, windows that, that would be built into the roof skylights. Uh, which are not as operationally friendly to us in the long haul. So you'll see a lot of these buildings now are putting up clear story windows on the sides of buildings to provide natural light uh, that doesn't impact the actual operation or visibility within the operation. We're taking a look, especially as uh, global warming considerations are coming, we're taking a look at how can we keep our facilities cooler. Now, this varies climate by climate. We obviously have to do different things in Northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, than we do, let's say, in Southern California. Uh, but we're using more and more green materials. We're adding more R value uh, specs to the insulation within our walls, within our roof structures. We want to be able to drive a natural approach to heating and cooling, not to, not to have to put more rooftop units, more ground level units to be able to meet the demand of what our employees and our tenants are looking for. But how can we use the natural earth and its resources to keep an optimal temperature? Uh, throughout, throughout our portfolio. So we're doing quite a bit of that. Um, a design consideration, and we went into this with our existing building, and thankfully it was designed to spec. Northeast Pennsylvania doesn't get significant snow, right? You guys don't get any snow? Not anymore. Here. Not anymore? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you know, like, like I said, you know, a few, a few moments ago, Design considerations can vary drastically, market by market, region by region. Northeast Pennsylvania, we have to take into consideration serious adjustment to the structural integrity of the building to the snow load capacity that can actually put on the roof. Those design considerations have to be built not just for snow load, but now if you want to look at solar initiatives and the capacity and weight that's going to be put on the roof from those. It takes a lot of design engineering to make sure that we're meeting the minimum targets, not just for today, but for the future, right? We all hope that, you know, products become lighter, products become more inexpensive, products become more efficient. But right now, all that we know is that we need to accommodate X per square foot to be able to... 
sol. So that's in a nutshell. Solar is just getting up Sharon, you if I stop share, do you want to try to share your screen? Um, I can just now hear you. The audio went out about 60 seconds ago and just came back. So um, oh, I said, um, if I stop sharing, could you share your screen? Because yep. I don't know that. Okay, that works. Did that work? Yeah, you're good. Awesome. Well, I will count on you guys to uh, let me know when I should stop so I don't go too far over on time. But I want to kind of real quickly introduce myself. Um, first of all, guys, I'm uh, my name is Aaron Patrick, and I'm the Director of Research and Development for the PPL Corporation. Um, so uh, I love my job. It is so cool. Uh, I kind of want to give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I have been in the same space for about 15 years. Um, my, first, my first job in the energy space 15 years ago was to push for a renewable portfolio standard in Kentucky. I was hired by the governor of Kentucky to be the assistant director of energy for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And we began work right away on uh, pushing for a renewable portfolio standard. Um, that's where my heart was 15 years ago. And my heart is still there. However, you know, we failed uh, in Kentucky to, to get that legislation passed. Um, and there's been no movement in the past 15 years towards renewables. In fact, this past week, uh, the Commonwealth of Kentucky passed a uh, new piece of legislation, Senate Bill 4, that prohibits the closure of a coal-fired power plant. So a little bit of the, you know, a little bit of the opposite of a renewable portfolio standard. Um, but that's, that's where my heart was. Um, I worked for the Commonwealth of Kentucky for seven years. Uh, and then when the, the governors changed, I changed teams as well and joined um, a PPL subsidiary, so it's a company owned by PPL, called Kentucky Utilities. And at Kentucky Utilities, I managed research and development. Um, about five years into it, uh, the CEO of PPL Corporation said, I want you to come work for me. And uh, so now I work for the COO and CEO of PPL Corporation. And I act as director of R&D for Pennsylvania Power and Light, Kentucky Utilities, Louisville Gas and Electric, Old Dominion Power, and Rhode Island Energy. And then I talk kind of quickly about our company. So, as you guys know, um, obviously you you all know PPL because it it, it services uh, customers all across Pennsylvania. But you may not know that the PPL Corporation is it's a Fortune 500 company um, with with utilities in, in multiple states, as I already said, including my home state of Kentucky. Um, our mission is quite simply to provide safe, affordable reliable, sustainable energy. Um, that's, that's really our mission. That word sustainable is new. That was not historically in the PPL mission. That was added this past year. And of course, I'm very excited um, about that addition. 
my department, uh, we, we've got a lot of really, really strong partnerships. Um, you guys see the Energy Impact Partners there in the, the top right-hand corner. Uh, I'm actually at Energy Impact Partners today. I'm in the New York City, um, Midtown Manhattan uh, offices. That's where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, but we work really closely with uh, different universities, um, especially uh, the University of Kentucky has been one of our really strong partners for multiple years. The vast majority of the work that we do is paid for by the federal government, not by our ratepayers. What we do is we go out and apply for clean energy projects and funding from the federal government, and then we use those dollars in our territory. So in Kentucky, in Pennsylvania, in Rhode Island, to deploy clean energy. We're also working with several national labs. Uh, we've got a total right now of 140 different research projects, and many of them are uh, funded, most of them are funded by the USDOE. Uh, we are members of the Electric Power Research Institute. Uh, in fact, um, our CEO, the PPL CEO, you all should be proud, he's vice chair of the board of, of the Electric Power Research Institute, and next year he will, he will assume the role as chairman of the board for EPRI. We're also a founding member of the Low Carbon Resources Initiative, which is um, really focused on decarbonizing gas and moving over to green hydrogen. So what are we working on? And I'll show you a few slides. Uh, this is kind of texty, so I'll move, move pretty quickly, but research and development uh, historically, so if we were to uh, go and talk to whoever had my job 30 or 40 years ago, they would have been focused on coal. They would have been focused on, and I, and I know because I've seen the records, they were focused on how do we handle coal ash? What do we do with the coal combustion residuals after, um, after coal-fired electricity generation is produced? Or how do we reduce emissions like sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide and mercury and particulates? And so all of the R&D in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was really focused on making coal cleaner. That is what I like to call legacy R&D. Modern R&D is really looking at modern technologies. So natural gas, solar, wind, lithium ion batteries, electric vehicles. We're also looking at future technologies. And what, what I mean by future technologies, well, those are technologies that, that we can build. And in fact, we already are building them, but they're not yet cost-effective. So solar, wind, batteries, those can all be cost-effective today. We can build them today and they can be cost-effective. But there's a series of technologies that are on the horizon that aren't quite yet commercially ready, including hydrogen, carbon capture, concentrated solar power, small modular nuclear reactors, and um, flow batteries. So we are, my team is, is drastically engaged in these two spaces. So I, I made a decision when I took this job that we would end all coal related research. And that's what I started doing immediately. Um, I'm, other departments or other groups wanna focus on coal, but I'm not going to. Um, I'm focused on the next era, the next, the next generation technologies. And so that is obviously solar and wind batteries, EVs, and then those future technologies, hydrogen, carbon capture, and SMRs. I want us to like pause just for a second, if I may. Um, this is a chart that I put together. And I meant to tell you guys in the beginning that um, I should have had a disclaimer that the views reflected here do not necessarily reflect the views of, of anyone. Um, because I put this slide deck together. When I was a civil servant, when I, when I worked for the, the uh, governor secretary of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, I, I spoke my mind, I spoke freely, and no one ever told me what to say. And I, and I thought when I came to a private company that someone might give me a script or tell me what I was supposed to say or not say, and that never happened. I, you know, these slides that I put together for you guys, no one's reviewed them. This, these are my thoughts that I wanted to share with you. So I, I just want you to know this is all coming from my heart. But these are some data that I think are just really, really fascinating. Uh, and you can download and play with these data yourself. Um, the Clean Air Markets Program Database at, at epa.gov, you can download it all. But this is a, a look at total sulfur dioxide emissions from electricity generation in three states that we serve, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. And what you'll notice, guys, is that we have collectively reduced sulfur dioxide emissions by 95%. This is remarkable. And in fact, if you look at the air quality data, the air that we are breathing in Pennsylvania, I don't know about New York because I'm in New York City right now, but uh, in Pennsylvania and in Kentucky, 
that air has never been cleaner, at least not since industrialization. We would have had to, we have to go back hundreds of years to get air as clean as the air that we are breathing today. And this is remarkable. Um, you know, this didn't happen by accident. Uh, 1995 is, is really where the data began. And the reason they began is because of the Clean Air Act amendments that were put forward by the US EPA and passed by Congress. Those Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 required the reduction of sulfur dioxide emissions. And research and development groups all over the country put together a suite of technologies that could do it. Um, and what the, they're called scrubbers or flue gas desulfurization systems. And what they do is they use wet limestone injection to spray into the coal flue gas path and uh, remove the sulfur dioxide from the coal fired electricity uh, emissions. But as you guys know, and Pennsylvania is a coal state, just like Kentucky is, coal is, is it's not clean. Um, you know, if you hold a piece of coal in your hand, you, you know it's not clean. If you, burn, if you burn coal without these emissions controls, you would see black smoke and soot. Um, but coal with these emissions controls, it's dramatically reduced. So 95% reduction in emissions. In addition to the emissions controls, there have actually been retirements of coal-fired power plants, and they're being replaced by cleaner, newer, modern technologies. For example, natural gas. Um, also, obviously, solar and wind are being deployed in all of these territories. So what you're seeing in this chart is the success of, of many decades of R&D. You know, I wish I could claim credit for this, but of course, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, this, is, this is, you know, our, our, our grandparents were working on these technologies many, many years ago and deployed them so that our air could be as clean as it is today. But I just want to, you know, stop and pause because because I feel like when I talk to student groups and I'm, I'm sorry I'm not there to talk to you guys today um, or I, I talk to people in the public and I, I sometimes ask the question do you think the air is getting cleaner or dirtier and quite commonly people tell me that the air is getting dirtier and dirtier and that's that's not actually true um, we've been very successful as a country at putting regulations in place to stop emissions this is the legacy R&D focus. Like I said, this is someone 30 or 40 years ago in my job would have been focused on this particular problem. Today's R&D focus, however, is carbon dioxide emissions. And this is a much different story because we've not reduced carbon dioxide emissions by 95%. Uh, as much as we would like to, we have not. Um, and when I say we, you know, I'm referring to the entire Commonwealth um, or the three, really the three states that are represented here. Rhode Island's really hard to see because they don't have very many emissions because they're so small. The good news is this chart is not just growing exponentially up. The good news is, is that we have already been successful at reducing carbon dioxide emissions by 40% since 1995. That's awesome. That is absolutely awesome. And this is not because of some sort of uh, control technology what this is, is actually the closure of coal-fired power plants and the replacement of coal plants with something cleaner, including natural gas, solar, and wind. That is what has driven the CO2 emissions down. Now, if we're to look at global CO2 emissions, you know, we might see a chart of emissions climbing and climbing and climbing because there are countries all over the world where they are industrializing for the first time, where they are building new power plants and increasing emissions. But at least here, uh, in, in our home states of Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island, emissions are actually headed in the right direction. I also want to point out on the, the right-hand side of that chart, I went ahead and put in the 2030 Obama administration goals. Some of you will recall that, that President Obama implemented the Clean Power Plan, uh, and that Clean Power Plan gave a specific target to the Commonwealths uh, and, and the states here. And I've shown those specific targets given by President Obama in, in 2030. Um, when, when President Trump was elected, he did vacate the Obama era um, clean power plan. And so it is no longer law. But it's exciting to look back at, at, at this chart and, and, and notice that we are already ahead. We're ahead you know, 8% below. We are 8% below the goal of the Obama administration almost 10 years ahead of schedule, really 10 years ahead of schedule. That's awesome. I think we should be so proud 
of what we've done to reduce emissions in sulfur dioxide and to reduce emissions in carbon dioxide. This is absolutely awesome, but we're not done, right? We're not done. PPL and all the PPL companies, we've set a, gar a target, um, net zero. We want zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2050. And that's a big challenge. And, um, you know, it's, it's actually gonna be quite easy to achieve an 85% or 90% emissions reduction. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but, you know, getting past 85 or 90% starts to require research and development. And that's what I'm doing today in New York. I have been meeting with different companies that have ideas for different technologies, solar technologies, battery technologies that will help us achieve that 100% goal. This is what I live every day. This is what my team lives every day. We wake up in the morning and our goal is, how do we reduce carbon dioxide down to zero by 2050? That's what we're working on. I wanna give you some examples of, of research projects and um, you know, I'll, I'll talk faster because I, I hope I'm not putting you all to sleep. This is one that I'm, I'm particularly excited about. Um, we built a, a solar farm in Kentucky. This is Kentucky's largest solar farm. And we built it in 2016. And um, initially when it was built, people put grass, grass seed down. That was the original design. And then they do what people do to manage grass. They hired a, a lawn mowing company to come in and weedy. And I spent a lot of time out on this solar farm. That was really my first job for PPL was to start monitoring the output and trying to figure out uh, what we need to do differently or better at our solar site. And one day the, the, the mowing crew of, of, of 30, 30 some odd uh, young people comes through with their weed eaters, their gasoline powered weed eaters. And they're doing what is quite frankly backbreaking work. They are bending over under the solar panels, weed eating. And I got to thinking, isn't there a better way? Uh, I had one of my students do some number crunching and, and you guys can do this number crunching yourselves, but you know, a weed eater, it doesn't have all the emissions controls that we just showed on the previous charts. A weed eater is taking gas and oil, blending it and just combusting it. All of you that have weed eated know that when you're done weed eating, you're dirty. You're not only dirty because you've got you know, grass pieces all over you, but you actually smell. You smell like burnt oil and gas. And, and the next time you weed eat with a, with a gasoline weed eater, take note of that. You know, our power plants have all of these controls to eliminate emissions, but your weed eater has no emissions controls. Um, not even like our cars. Our cars have uh, catalytic converters. Our power plants have selected catalytic reduction to reduce nitrous oxide. The weed eaters have none. They just spray it. And the really, really scary thing about it is they're spraying that emissions right in your face. It's right there in front of you. But it's backbreaking, a lot of people involved. But then I went after the economics of it. And I got the numbers on, on what we were paying to weed eat the solar farm. It was $95,000 a year. And I thought, I bet we can do this better. So we got a biologist uh, to work with us and we came up with a custom seed mix of plants that are all native to central Kentucky. 64 native plants that do not grow higher than 36 inches so that they will never shade our panels and uh, plants that grow at different parts of the, of the year, different times of the year. You know, you can see down there in the bottom right hand corner, you see these really um, pretty yellow flowers. You see the black eyed Susans there in the middle. Uh, what you can't tell here is, because when you look out, you see all one color, but that's because we picked plants that will bloom at different times. So if you go one week and then you come back a week later, you know, this yellow lane would be completely blue a week later and purple two weeks later, et cetera. And it's, it's, it's almost like a firework show in, in, in slow motion. This project has, has worked really well. Overall, we've reduced the costs to our customers by 50% of maintaining the site. We've done pollinator counts of um, you know, how many new monarch butterflies we have uh, and bumblebees, et cetera. And we, we've seen an explosion in life um, at the site. One of the things that we weren't really expecting was an explosion in the finch population. Um, there's just the tons of finches flying around the site that are not only eating seeds from the wildflowers, but they're also eating insects. It's, it's a really beautiful ecosystem that's been created. But as you guys know, it still has to be mowed once a year. But as you know, I don't wanna use lawnmowers. 
Um, this is another zoom in real quick. This is um, our intern Chad took this photo last summer. It's just it's just really pretty. I, I, I love it. Love this project. Uh, it's me and an, another intern, uh, Stephen, walking through. But here's our lawnmowers. Um, we we went out and 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 fought again about that ninety five thousand dollars a year to, to to mow and weed eating. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I bet there's a better way. I bet there's a more natural way, a more organic way that will reduce emissions and lower costs. And this is it. This is our team of 125 sheep uh, that live at our solar farm, that uh, give birth at our solar farm, and they have a really, really uh, a happy life. You can actually watch our sheep live. Um, I don't think they're in front of the cameras today, but we do have uh, security cameras that were at the site before, and they were for security purposes, but I could see this, the cameras. And I noticed because a lot of my teammates at work would come to my desk and they'd be like, I want to see the sheep, show me the sheep. And so I'd show them the security camera. And we finally got the idea like, gosh, let's just live stream the sheep to the web. And so we do. This is uh, an iPhone photo I took of, of the sheep kind of running around. And you can see what it looks like after they've grazed it down. Um, you know, this is just a big salad buffet to them. And uh, it, 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 it works really well. This is Kentucky's largest lithium ion battery. I'm sorry, I'm a, um, you know, I'm a Kentucky native, so I'm talking about a lot of what we've done in Kentucky, but we're really proud of Kentucky's largest battery. It is located right next to our solar farm and it stores solar power by day and discharges that power by night. This is a quick look at some of the data. Um, our solar and battery sites, we, we live stream the data that we're, we're collecting uh, to the public. That was, that was something that, that I think frustrated me when I was in government is I couldn't get access to data of like what's going on in the solar, what's going on in the batteries. And so that's something we've done at, at PPL is we just live stream our data for everyone to access and everyone to use. There have been a lot of academic publications from different universities using these data and um, Argonne National Labs, Pacific National Labs and the Electric Power Research Institute actually use the data we're collecting here to research how to improve um, solar and battery. Uh, another project, uh, this is, it, it's just, I'm, we've got 140 projects. I'm not going to show them all. I'm just going to show you some of my favorites. Um, PPL is also uh, the leading sponsor for um, what is the solar car. Uh, so we've made a commitment, PPL has made a commitment to get rid of fossil fuels in our light duty vehicles. And we're moving completely over to um, not only renewable power, but electric vehicles. And as, as part of that research, we've, we've funded uh, the University of Kentucky to build and test uh, electric vehicles run completely on renewables. And this is a student project. So it's kind of an example of, of what our students do is, you know, it, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm helping them financially, but it's the students that are doing all the engineering and all the testing. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of them. They've, um, they've won several national competitions and uh, you know, last year they won first place and, and, and beat out MIT, which was something they were really excited about. We're also uh, researching re uh, recycling of, of solar panels and batteries. Um, you know, there's a lot of solar being built all across the country and there's a lot of batteries being put in all across the country. And so we're working to come up with ways to, to reuse those solar panels, uh, break down the materials and give them a new life and a new solar panel or in a new battery. We've also got a really strong carbon capture program. Um, we that system there on the left, you can see me standing there with uh, a, a group of visitors that we had. But that is a you know that seven story carbon capture system is one of three at power plants in the United States that's actively capturing carbon dioxide from the flue gas uh, so that it can be stored or transported or or reused somewhere else. Most of this, almost all of this, is being paid for by the federal government. And uh, so we're really excited to do this uh, in our territory and um, bring a lot of research scholars to the universities in the process. Now I'm gonna introduce you to a problem that we have with solar power. And now I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap up because I'm probably over on time. This is a chart that I made a few years ago, but the black squiggly line in the middle is live solar generation data uh, collected at every one second. And what this chart is doing is it's scrolling through the entire year of 2017. And what you'll notice is obviously uh, solar is changing every day. In fact, it's changing every minute as, as the sun is blocked by clouds or as the sun comes out. But you'll notice around 7 a.m. you see the sun coming up and solar power generating 
And then around 7 p.m., you see uh, the sun setting and solar power stopping, and obviously no solar power through the night. The blue squiggly line is our customer's electricity demand. So that's your house, that's everybody's house, all wrapped up. And, and, and you see the difference in the profiles, particularly in the winter. Right now, it's flicking through um, January. You'll notice that we have an early morning peak when it's really cold, and we have a late afternoon peak. And, and so there's a, there's a problem that's created by, by just using um, lots and lots of, of solar power. It's that the power is not available 24 seven. The obvious answer of this of, is of course batteries. You know, batter, solar plus batteries can provide that nice stable 24 seven power. But what I wanna talk to you about is the fact that additional renewables can, can also help. Let's skip this. And uh, this is a paper uh, that we've um, we just published a few weeks ago. Um, it's it's really on on how to get Kentucky down to to zero percent greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, I worked on this with a group of PhD students at the University of Kentucky and uh, a professor at Oxford University England and a professor at the University of Kentucky. And what we've done here, so the, the gray in the charts is our coal-fired power plants, the the brown are gas, and yellow is solar. On the left-hand side, you can see a, a kind of a cloudy week with not a lot of sun. And on the right-hand side, you can see a really bright week with, with, with lots of sun. And what you'll notice is that um, that black squiggly line on the top, that's our customer's electricity demand for that particular week. But what you'll notice is even if we add lots and lots and lots of solar, at some point, that solar becomes too much to be used at that moment of the day. And so it's either it needs to go to a battery or it to be shifted around in time, or heaven forbid, this is terrible, but or the solar power would have to be turned off. And so you can see that solar is being introduced, but the coal-fired electricity generation on the bottom is not dropping. It's not going away. Why? Well, coal units, they are essentially a 20-story tower uh, pot of water. You know, the, the question, how long does it take to bo boil a pot of water? That's what we're doing inside of a coal plant. We're boiling a big pot of water and creating steam. Because of that, it can't turn off fast enough to accept the solar power. And it can't turn back on fast enough to come back when the solar power is done. So in our computer simulations, obviously we can just click a button and we went ahead and all the coal plants are gone. And in this simulation, you see that we've got new natural gas fired power plants in place. These new plants are actually capable of accepting much more solar power. You'll also see in the blue that we've, we've gone in and, and brought in wind. On the left-hand side, you see a, a winter week with kind of weak solar power, but really windy conditions. And what you'll notice is the wind actually blows at night and is providing a lot of power at times when the solar wasn't available. So obviously, like I said, the answer is, you know, get a battery and use a battery to shift solar power in time. But we also have the option of using what I like to call nighttime solar panels, AKA windmills, uh, because the two, they pair so nicely together. We have solar in the day and solar in the summer, but in the winter and at night, we have wind. And so the two make a really good team. This is a, uh, one of our PhD students, Rosemary made these charts and it's, it's kind of cool. It's, it's, it's looking at where we start to have too much renewables. Um, given the different portfolios that we had. So we had two coal portfolios I showed you and two gas portfolios. So the coal, coal is up on top and gas is in the bottom. Uh, and, and what you'll notice is that the retiring the coal units, you know, not only does it reduce emissions, but, but it actually improves our ability to integrate renewables because the coal units just aren't flexible enough. And this is one chart that just kind of shows it all. And again, this is for Kentucky, but honestly, the answer is gonna be similar in Pennsylvania or anywhere else. On the left-hand side at the bottom of this chart, we have our current world, as I like to call it. That's with no emissions reductions from where we are and zero dollars spent to try to fix the problem. And what you'll notice is we can integrate solar and wind into that coal portfolio to reduce emissions up to a point. That point, it, it varies by circuit, it varies by neighborhood, but typically that point is around 20%. And once you get to 20% with a coal portfolio, you start to run into problems where the coal units can't ramp up or down fast enough and costs go up, but emissions don't really get reduced. And so it's, it's not quite as effective as you'll notice the gas portfolio. So in the bottom left-hand 
corner of the of the gas part, the blue, the brown part of the chart, um, you can see building gas reduces emissions by 60% right off the bat versus coal. And we can integrate a lot more solar and wind and get all the way up to 85% emissions reduction. Now, our goal is not 85%, though our goal is 100%. And so to get to 100%, we really do need some of those future techs. If you guys remember earlier, I was talking about you know, current technologies versus the future techs. And those future techs would include either carbon capture or large scale batteries or flow batteries or hydrogen um, combined with wind and solar to give us 100% renewable penetration. Now, the problem is where we wanna be is in the bottom right-hand corner of this chart, right? 100% emissions reduction and no cost. That's what you want. The problem is those technologies right now are expensive. Um, today, in, in, in 2023, if we went to 100% using those technologies, a lot of money would need to be spent. So again, like I said, what is our R&D focus? Our R&D focus is on lowering the costs of all of those clean energy technologies so that we can move to 100% while maintaining low cost for our customers and maintaining reliability. That's our goal. Um, like I said, this paper is available. Uh, yeah, I put a link there to it. So you can download the paper. So it's, we made it public access, um, but it's in a, it's in a third party uh, journal, an academic journal, and you can download that. Um, and also I've got obviously our, our email address and website there. Feel free to send an email. So that, that email will go directly to my iPhone, but it also copies um, all my researchers. And that's really important because I can't always respond to everything as quickly as I'd like. So if you send an email to that research box, it'll go to me, but it'll also go to, to my whole team. And I don't know if we're gonna take questions or wait, wait till later. Yeah, unless there is a burning question that we have right now. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for letting me talk to you guys and I would like to come up in person. So send me an invite and oh, I look forward to seeing you all in person. Um, I think you're going to need to stop sharing. Yep. Perhaps and then connecting. I seem to have lost audio again from your end. I don't know if <clears throat> Christy, you. you can hear me. Okay. I didn't know if you were speaking or not. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Krista and everyone who's attending here today. I'm very honored to be a part of this conversation and very sorry that it can't be there in person. Pittsburgh is a bit of a drive. Um, so I do appreciate being here by Zoom and, and saving my carbon footprint <laughs> for that. Um, again, my name is Sharon Pillar. I'm the founder and executive director of the Pennsylvania Solar Center. And we've been around for about four years now. I just want to share briefly a little bit about our organization, and then I'll tell you about our Get Solar program, which I think is what maybe some of you are most interested in. Um, our, our mission and vision, our vision is that Pennsylvania becomes a leader in renewable energy through the rapid and broad expansion of in-state solar and also storage. And we also support um, the expansion of other renewables and energy efficiency and smart grid and all of those, all of the above. But um, our focus is solar since that will be the main renewable resource um, built out in Pennsylvania. And our mission is to, we accomplish this by providing trusted guidance to usher all Pennsylvanians into the clean energy economy to create more resilient communities. Um, I just wanted to, these are our funders. Um, we have a lot of foundation supporters and also um, clean energy industry support as well. Uh, but really the way we operate at the Solar Center as a nonprofit, we have sort of a three bucket approach. So we um, focus on uh, transform, educate, and advocate are our 
three uh, legged stool. And I'm going to really focus on what I'm talking about today is the transform is walking the walk and our technical assistance. But um, first, I just wanted to provide a little background about some of the other things that we do at the Solar Center. Um, we do have a number of online resources. We have a, a monthly newsletter. If you are really wanting to learn about what's going on in solar in Pennsylvania, you can please sign up for that. We have um, basically trying to build out resources for every solar stakeholder. So while we don't do technical assistance for homeowners, we have information there for them um, and municipalities and really just everybody who's trying to go solar and also building those out. We have an award program where we're going around Pennsylvania, sort of county or region by region, to lift up those who have already gone solar, like Romac is a great example of you know, what they're doing in the community and um, so that people can see them as the leaders and they've been doing that for a while. So big applause to them. And we have a solar directory of uh, qualified uh, developers that you can click on by county to find for your home or your business. Um, so we do have some of those resources uh, available and we have a webinar series called Watts and Learn that we do every month around different topics uh, for, for uh, solar. And we also do policy education and advocacy. Uh, we have a solar legislative guide that that, will, uh, that we're starting to update for this legislative session that provides information about every solar related bill that is in um, the state, in the General Assembly in Pennsylvania. We're also working and hopefully to release uh, guidebooks for landowners who are going to be leasing their land for solar or interested in that. There've been a lot of landowners approached by solar developers or what we call the landmen that were leasing land around for gas, now they're they're walking around leasing land for solar in Pennsylvania. Um, and also another guidebook for zoning for large scale solar for municipalities as well. So those should be coming out in the next few months. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the policy, but I am gonna mention this particular policy because it is our, uh, let's say our Keystone Renewable Energy Policy in Pennsylvania and it drives some of the financing that I'm gonna talk about. So renewable, the alternative energy portfolio standard was passed back in um, 2004. And th these are our pri priorities now. When it was passed, <laughs> um, it was 18% alternative energy by May of 2021. Now that's broken down into two tiers. So 8% of that 18% would be renewables by May of 2021. And that's what we call tier one. And you can see all the resources that are included there. And then there's a carve out for solar called, uh, we call it the solar carve out that is now um, one half a percent uh, for in-state solar. Those goals have been met and surpassed. We're getting close to 1% solar uh, installed in Pennsylvania, but because these goals are pretty old now, they really need to be modernized and we are looking to push those goals. And I know the governor had promised this in his campaign uh, to 30% renewables by 2030. And some of those resources um, are coming from our PGM electric grid to meet that. So it's not all in state um, resources. And there are a number of good reasons for that to remain the same, to keep um, wholesale prices down across the region and also carbon emissions across the region. But I'm not going to say a lot more about this, but this particular policy drives what we call a solar renewable energy credit. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the other policy priority that we would like to see is enabling community solar. There are, I think, 30 some states or close to that that have community solar. We do not have that available in Pennsylvania. And then we also are defending against any unfriendly solar policies. So those are our main priorities that we're doing on the, that we're working on the policy level. Um, but I wanna talk to you about our transform area and that is our, our Get Solar program, which is galvanizing our energy transition through solar. And um, this program is a hands-on program that is um, a streamlined process, very, streamline deadlines to pass people through uh, assessing their solar potential, 
and their feasibility, getting bids out uh, fr from qualified developers and helping them really finalize and make a decision and understanding the financing around it. So we usher and walk entities through this. This is really, this is only for commercial entities. So basically anything that's not a residential entity, we're helping to go solar. So that could be a small business, a large business. Uh, we're working with industries, not a lot of nonprofits, schools, municipalities, hospitals, libraries, all sorts of people were getting requests from across uh, the state. So I wanted to share a little bit how this, this program works. It's, as I said, a very streamlined process. We have a, a pre-qualification survey, which is really simple. And then you, you fill that out and send us your electric bill. And we do a very high level feasibility study um, and provide you what as, sort of an, a ballpark estimate about the cost of the system and some of the financial estimates. And I'll show you an example of one uh, industrial client that we're working with right now. Um, second, if you are interested and you look like you have a good solar potential and we'll go to the next step. We'll place your project out to bid to regional developers. We like to use Pennsylvania developers uh, for economic development reasons. We wanna keep the jobs in Pennsylvania if we can. Um, but there are some entities that are open to using other regional developers who are also working in Pennsylvania and we are um, also fine with that. But we, we put that out to bid. Organizations uh, send in their uh, projects through the bid process and then we get them back. And if you've ever seen any of these proposals, they're long and probably very confusing for people who have never worked with uh, solar before. So what we do is we call it our apples to apples comparison. We take those bids and we put them into a really neat, clean, um, really couple pages to show you the differences between the different projects and the main points to look at. And, and we give you the full proposal as well. But, um, and then we walk you through and help you understand them. We compare the com proposals and the entity, the client makes the decision. We do not provide our opinion, but, but just providing the, um, the information so that you can make an informed decision. Um, and then once you choose a developer to work with, they finalize the proposal, the project, and then, um, we kind of sit in the background. We don't want to interfere with the developers, but we also want to be there to help you guide through the process. And then when you flip the switch, as we say, we're there to help with PR uh, through our communications department. Um, and so to really lift you up in the, the community and show all the great work and decisions that you've made. Our Get Solar program has expanded um, and has sort of morphed into um, some more specialties, but the one that most of you would be probably coming into is our Get Solar Trailblazers. And this is sort of our, our um, anybody can come into the program at any time and we'll, we'll get you through the process. Um, I'll just also mention in case you have connections into your communities, we are also working with this same Get Solar program, but very specifically on the community level. So, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but we're looking at whole communities and assessing their business and nonprofit solar potential, and then working with community leaders to try to and, you know, encourage those entities to go solar and through the Get Solar program. We're also starting to work directly with municipalities for solar for their municipalities themselves for their local government, as well as school di districts. Um, we're also starting agri-solar program with some partners that to grow. I mean, Erin uh, showed a great example. We have a couple examples of solar shepherds in Pennsylvania and pollinators. And we now have some farmers who actually want to grow crops under solar. And so we're going to be doing, um, I think, a pilot project here uh, around that, which we're really excited about. And also starting to work with faith communities as well. Um, the Get Solar program so far, the, these numbers, I, I didn't get them from my team, the updated, these are uh, a little bit older now. We, we're getting an enormous amount of requests uh, in just in the last two months, I think, with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. But we have um, now bid out more than 60 projects over the last couple of years 
with a potential of over 12 megawatts of solar. Um, and by this spring, we'll have two megawatts of projects um, installed on six different projects and an investment of $3.2 million, which is um, pretty exciting for the short amount of time that we've been doing this. So we're, we're growing and expanding this. We just hired two more people. So we have three people on our Get Solar team. Um, the Get Solar Communities Program, as I mentioned, has, um, we had pilot communities in Meadville, Pennsylvania, and then three, um, the Triborough, they call themselves three uh, little municipalities outside of the city of Pittsburgh came in, we bid out an, another 21 projects to that. And there were just, we've gotten the bids back and there, we had to wait a little bit because with the IRA that came out last fall, they had to rebid all these projects and reconfiguring them, um, making decisions and going forward. We're currently working with these four um, municipalities, most of them in Western Pennsylvania. Um, but next week, I think we are going to be uh, releasing our Achibian RFA. It's a request for application for new communities. We'll be selecting another five or six communities and they can be anywhere in Pennsylvania. And again, we, we have a solar for schools or partnering with an, an, another nonprofit called Generation 180, offering technical assistance for uh, schools to go solar. And we have about 15 schools in our queue right now for that. I wanted to step back and just get everybody on the same page. I think probably a lot of people know this, but often I find in audiences that there are kind of different ideas about some of the lingo and things that we're talking about. So largely we're talking about distributed generation, um, which is would be what we'd be called behind the meter. So it's solar that's being used on site and it's typically connected into the grid. So grid tied. So that, as Aaron was showing you, you know, you're producing energy during the day, but at night you're pulling back off the grid. So um, these systems are net metered. So if you overproduced one month um, in Pennsylvania, we have a law for the investor-owned utilities have to honor net metering. So if you overproduce in like May or June, just good good solar months, then you would get credited on your bill for the, the following month. So you're kind of, it's like a bank account. You're rolling that over every month until you get into like November, December, January, maybe you're not producing as much and then you're pulling off of that credit. And then at the end of May, there's a true up and you're compensated for um, the remainder of that or any excess. Um, but that isn't that compensation is not quite as um, generous at that point. So another reason to size your system to exactly what your needs are going to be, and I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but when we talk about distributed generation or customer generators, we're talking about either residential systems or commercial sector, um, and that's again what we're kind of working up in Pennsylvania. Those systems can go up to three megawatts. Um, or in some very special cases could go up to five megawatts with special permission from the utility um, to provide services, uh, emergency uh, ancillary services. Uh, but we don't have a lot of those approved in Pennsylvania yet, but maybe we will in the future. Um, we also talk about community solar. This Again, we don't have this in Pennsylvania yet. So uh, if the legislation, there's several pieces of legislation they go through, those systems could be up to five megawatts. And in these cases, there'd be um, a, a solar array built over here um, within the electric distribution territory. And then different entities where residents or businesses could subscribe to a portion of the energy that's produced from that array and then be credited on their bills. So for entities that don't have good rooftops or solar access, um, and sometimes they just don't have the finance, finances to do that upfront. Community solar could be a really game changer for a lot of different entities. And we're really hoping that that goes forward. And then the third um, scale, is grid scale or utility scale solar. These are much larger systems. Um, Aaron was showing you some of those that were, um, I think were probably utility scale or, or projects. So these are often tied directly into the transmission grid. Um, and those are much bigger systems. 
typically in Pennsylvania, most developers are looking at 15 to 20 megawatts or over um, to build these kind of projects. And most, if you're a very, very large entity, we've had some industrial customers approach us and they need 18 megawatts of power. So they could enter into something called a virtual power purchase agreement. And I could talk about that and how that works where there's a project offsite it doesn't even really have to be in Pennsylvania, um, but they can buy the power from that. And they're basically um, in a power agreement to buy the that, but they're still buying the solar power that's being put onto the grid. And again, we can talk about that if you have questions. Um, I also, you know, when we talk about solar, most of the time we're just talking, we're talking about the technology and the costs and how to finance it. And those are the two, major pieces and important um, considerations, among other things. But some of the lingo and some around the financing, I thought I would mention, it did mention the renewable energy credits that came from the alternative energy portfolio standard policy. Um, so the way that works is that for every one megawatt hour of energy that you generate from the solar, you earn one renewable energy credit. So a typical house is about seven kilowatts in Pennsylvania solar system. And that would generate about um, 8.4 megawatt hours, and that equivalent to 8.4 SREX a year. Um, in Pennsylvania, that's close to about $300, so which is a pretty low amount compared to other states that have more valuable SRECs. And one of the reasons why we want to increase our goals because that potentially could increase those the value of those renewable energy credits. And then that provides another financing option for you. I already talked about net metering, a very valuable um, policy we have in Pennsylvania. And then the Inflation Reduction Act, which I'll go into a little bit more detail. But for businesses, we also, uh, another tax benefit that you have access to is uh, the maker's depreciation, which is a modified accelerated cost recovery system where a large portion of that system can be depreciated over the first five years of the system. And that can equate to, depending on your tax, um, where you are in your tax bracket, could be anywhere around 20 to 25% of the system. So it's really quite a valuable tax benefit. Um, I'm gonna skip this right now. This goes into a little bit how SREX work, but just for time, I can go back to that if people really wanna talk about it. I did wanna mention the Inflation Reduction Act on the high level that these tax credits were passed um, in last fall. And these are in, in orange are the ones that as, as businesses or industries that you would be more most interested in. Um, just to give you, um, the Department of Energy does have some of this guidance out. We're still waiting for some of the guidance, particularly on the energy communities to come out so that we can understand that. But essentially <laughs> what you can count on right now and for several, almost 10 years, you can pretty much count on a 30% um, tax credit if you meet certain qualifications. So if the project has um, starting next year, if that project, um, sorry, or excuse me, starting this year, also has domestic content. So the IRA, IRS or the um, legislature when they passed it, so so much, a certain percentage of the equipment has to be made in America, basically. And then that percentages grow over time. We don't have all the ruling and regulations out for that yet. Um, but that in order to get, um, uh, you would get that tax credit um, available for the domestic content. Um, and there are, there are labor requirements that are also um, in place for projects that are over a megawatt. Um, and then there are other bonus credits that are available for entities that are in low income areas or that are, call, that are energy community. And those are a large portion, probably going to be a large portion of Pennsylvania of Northern and Western and a lot of central Pennsylvania where there were coal fire uh, plant retirements and um, in other uh, energy transition camp uh, communities. So these are, we can look at those in more detail when we do your 
performers and we look at what your potentials are, we spell all of those out for you. But there are quite generous. So with the 30% tax credit, and if you're in a low income area and also an energy community, you know, you're looking at um, 50 or 60 percent tax credit in some cases along then on top with the depreciation. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention back here was the USA USDA reprints and loans, which are for businesses in rural counties or rural areas in Pennsylvania. Um, and that's a large portion of Pennsylvania outside of the major urban areas. And those are for mostly large uh, or sorry, small businesses but it is a great uh, opportunity to reduce the cost even more. Uh, and then CPACE funding, if we have time, we can talk about that, it's another financing option that's available in some counties in Pennsylvania. Um, I did wanna give you just a couple examples of projects we've worked on. This is a community college in Allegheny County. Now this is a, a tax exempt organization, so worked a little bit differently but they entered into what we call a power purchase agreement. So the solar on their rooftop, they don't own, it's owned by a third party. Um, they will own it for 28 year, a 28 year agreement. And they, uh, CCAC is basically buying and purchasing the power from that particular system. And they wanted to do that. They didn't want to be responsible for the operations and maintenance. They just wanted to pay for the energy. and. Oh, we don't, I guess we don't have this on here, but they are saving um, substantial money even after um, entering into the power purchase agreement, um, you know, almost a million dollars over the over that uh, 25 year or 28 year period of time. But I did want to share um, a couple industrial customers that we're working with or have worked with. Burner Air Curtains has they're going solar, their, their project is signed and they're gonna be building that any day. I guess there's equipment already delivered on site. They're expanding their facilities. And so they've actually uh, planned their solar for their new expansion. It's a 1.3 megawatt project. Um, they did apply, they've applied for the USDA refinance. That would save them another 40%. And they will be receiving the IRA tax benefits. So the 30%, I believe they're in a um, low income area as well. Um, and they're getting a first energy rebate, rebate, which will save an additional 25,000. This is a one time or over a one year period um, that most of the utilities, and I know PPL has one of these rebate programs that's under Act 129. Um, and some of the other utilities do as well. But with everything that they are going to be, all the different finance, this uh, financing stack, they're expecting to see uh, savings of $2.5 million over, the t over 25 years. And that was calculated before we had the huge cost uh, increases um, in electricity over the last year. So there, this is a substantial savings for them. Um, we're also currently working with a large steel fabricator in Western Pennsylvania. They, um, I'll just jump ahead and show you their building. Um, this, this is their building, the one with the darker roof is not their building. Um, but this is where the solar, the best solar potential would be um, for those, for this particular project. They could actually cover 100% of their electricity usage for over the year with solar. Um, if they were not to go solar, we estimate that they would be paying over $4 million, $4.3 million over the next 25 years um, by not going solar. And that's with a, just a small estimated increase of about 3% escalator on their electricity cost. Um, but by going solar, we estimate that they will have $126,000 in savings every year. Um, or over four, almost five million dollars over over a period of uh, twenty five years. So this is the uh, this is the estimate that we give entities when they come to us. Um, we'll do a feasibility study and we'll we'll show them and lay all of this out what we um, upfront think that we based on our experience and uh, what we're finding through our estimating tools what 
um, an entity could expect to see for costs and savings across that time. Um, this is again, to, this um, their solar, if this 2.2 megawatt rooftop system would uh, be about the equivalent of um, 1772 metric tons of carbon that they were saving every year. Uh, we are also exploring battery storage to reduce their demand charges. Um, and so with solar on a commercial entity, you, you do, you still, you're pay paying your demand charges um, because the utility needs to know that they have to be ready any moment. Like if the solar is not um, if shady or cloudy or it's in the middle of winter, but they have, somebody has to be meeting that electricity demand. Uh, and be ready to do that. So your demand charges are still have to be met. Solar can, depending on the business and how it's run, um, could be very advantageous, or batteries could be very advantageous to shave off some of that demand uh, charges and that cost. So we're exploring that. We look, we had to look at 15 minute interval data, data from the utility for them to see if this is a good idea or not for them. But we do think that this client, because of the, their operations and how they can uh, change sometimes during the day when they use certain types of operations, uh, they might be a really good candidate for this. So we're pretty excited about exploring that. And also working, we're probably gonna be working with the utility a little closer on that as well. Um, this, we use Helioscope, which is a very standard solar design software that developers use to do an estimate feasibility study for entities. And again, this is um, their building. So let's stop there and see if there's any questions. Thank you. Um, I guess, unless there's a burning question, we could hold it. We have one more presentation. Is that, is that good enough, everybody? Um, Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'm uh, Joe Rinelli. I'm faculty here at Penn State Hazleton. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our engineering program at Hazleton that's related to alternative energy and uh, some of the work that we do. Um, so, you know, the background is going to be similar to what a lot of other people have talked about. Basically, there's an energy transition happening as we transition from traditional, traditional forms of generation into uh, more modern forms of generation. And those of you who have heard the term smart grid, this is kind of what that's all getting at. So instead of having a big central generation facility that only pushes power out to our houses, as we think about things like renewables and distributed generation, we're gonna see those going out on rooftops, uh, going out on different parts of the grid. And it's going to lead to a need to have a grid that's more flexible, more versatile, can handle power flows in different directions. And how do we manage all these things together? Uh, we know that this is going to happen. This growth is already happening. We already saw that in some of these slides and it's going to continue. Uh, if you look at job growth in the energy sector, all the growth that we're seeing reported by uh, the Department of Energy in their reports is showing that this growth is in these modern technologies. It's not in the legacy energy. Um, 
as Aaron talked about. So things like solar, wind, batteries, smart grids, electric vehicles, these are the places where job growth is happening. And uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, as she mentioned in the previous presentation, is really going to drive this as well. This has been a huge uh, source of additional incentives that these things are going to uh, cause this transition just based on the economics alone, uh, even without some additional uh, motivation. So from an education perspective, uh, we need to think about this in an engineering education perspective specifically. There are some things that this leads to us needing to think about. So for example, I'm a mechanical engineer. I wasn't trained on renewable energy systems and nobody from a traditional engineering discipline is ready to come out of school and get plugged right in to what it takes to do renewables. So for example, if you look at the different things you need to do to do solar, flip through because I have a couple. So it's uh, to understand the sun, the solar resource, its transmission to the earth's surface. This is a thing that mechanical engineers study when we train mechanical engineers the way we have for decades. When we wanna talk about understanding the solar panels, these are things that material scientists have really uh, looked at. How do those semiconductors work? Understanding the grid and how we turn the DC power that's produced by a solar panel into AC power and then put it on the grid and have it integrate with the grid and keep everything working. That's a topic for electrical engineering and uh, batteries, which are also part of this, and we've heard people mention there are various reasons you're doing batteries, that's really a topic for chemical engineering. So in order to deal with these systems and deal with all aspects of them, we need people that are trained in a way that's not the way we've been training people for these legacy systems. So the degree that exists here at Hazleton, and this is a pretty unique degree, there's only a few schools nationwide that have degrees that are focused on preparing people to do alternative energy. Uh, it's our degree here called Alternative Energy and Power Generation. It's part of a uh, Bachelor of Science and Engineering degree that's at a couple of Penn State campuses, but we're the only ones doing the Alternative Energy and Power Generation. So it's a multidisciplinary combination of some of the traditional disciplines that's really focused on helping these graduates be ready to solve these problems that are coming. These problems are the future. And I say to students when they come, a prospective students, in a sense, this is going to be one of the major engineering challenges for this generation, where in the 1950s and 60s, it may have been the space race. Now, one of the major engineering challenges is going to be this transition from legacy energy to renewable smart grid and all the things that go with it. So that's what we're trying to look at. Ooh, this turned out tiny on the screen, that's okay. Uh, so we have, we have, I'm kind of showing the breakdown of how these courses work out. So we have a section of the degree that's traditionally what you would think of in electrical engineering. It's a circuit sequence, uh, but focused on electrical power. So we're, we're not necessarily doing the full diversity of electrical engineering. We're doing the parts that are relevant. Then in mechanical engineering, it's the same thing. We have those thermodynamics, those energy courses that mechanical engineers study, uh, fluid mechanics as well for wind turbines. So we, we pick the parts out of there that you need to be able to do this. Likewise for chemical engineering. And then this last piece that I labeled design and integration, this is where we're taking these things and applying them. So how do we design a solar array? How do we design a wind turbine? How do we have these things integrate into the grid, affect the electricity marketplace? All the kinds of things that we saw in the previous presentations, we're trying to prepare our students to really be equipped to answer those questions, deal with those problems from a technical uh, perspective. And then we also have capstone design that I mentioned, and I'll come back to that a little bit. That's kind of a capstone final experience for the students doing something real, doing a way to apply all of this to really produce it. Uh, importantly, our graduates have been successful. They're coming out of the program. They're doing really well. We're really proud of them. Unfortunately, my pictures stop at 2019 because of the pandemic, but 
we have our alumni event tomorrow night and I'm really looking forward to getting to see some of our graduates and hopefully update these pictures. Um, but our graduates are out there. Some of them are working in the energy sector. Some of them are doing uh, what this training has prepared them for. But one thing I always like to mention to people is just because our focus is alternative energy and that's what we're trying to prepare them for, that doesn't mean it's the only thing they can do. A lot of our graduates here are just working in uh, engineering in a more general sense. And this multidisciplinary background that they're getting, it turns out has prepared them really well to work in a variety of engineering sectors. So we're thankful for that. Uh, we have a great faculty on the campus. They're mostly sitting over here at the table. Um, so just to give you an idea of some of the different research. So our faculty, our tenure track faculty, uh, doing research involved in a lot of different things. So just giving you an idea of what we do, uh, Dr. Yuri, who's our program coordinator, he's an expert at lithium ion battery development and fabrication. Uh, Dr. Boz, she's working on uh, GIS, that's uh, geographic information system. So like map tools based uh, electric vehicle charging stations and a framework looking at the power network and power traffic considerations for that, uh, electricity markets and those sort of things. We have uh, Dr. Bobby Agari. He studies uh, DC microgrids, management, control, and how to uh, utilize these DC microgrid systems. And I do some work related to the solar resource, analyzing the resource, modeling it, looking at the variability, and hopefully using those to better forecast. Uh, what solar generation is going to do on the grid. Um, so we engage as much as possible with local partners to do projects to help make the degree real for our students and make those connections to what they're going to be doing after they graduate. So there's a number of different ways that we do that that I'm going to go through in the next few slides. So these are a couple examples of capstone projects. We had a group a few years ago they worked with the Anthracite Region Centers for Independent Living to develop a backup power system or identify uh, one on the market actually for people living with disabilities who rely on assistive technologies that use electricity. When a power goes out, they still need access to these devices to live their lives. And so they were looking at a backup system for them. Uh, we had some students, I'm gonna mention, uh, this is last year's project, so I was really proud of these guys. They did a great job designing, considering different options, and then designing ultimately a parking lot canopy solar array for a retirement community out in State College. And I just heard uh, in the past couple of weeks, their, the uh, retirement community is now starting to go out and actually look to design and actually build a system uh, partly following up on what these students had worked on. So that was really awesome. Uh, the year before these guys, we actually had students do another solar array design uh, for an island resort in the Caribbean, Turks and Caicos. So that was sponsored by uh, Carl Zimmerman. So thank you for that, Carl. Um, and then I wanted to highlight this year's team. We have some of our students here and they're doing great work. This is the first year we're actually participating in a national competition called the Solar District Cup. And so this is a competition where they provide you with a district and they ask you to analyze essentially all the kinds of things that we saw in the previous presentation, where financially, where economically, where technically can these things be installed in this district. And so our students are working on that. We got uh, assigned the district of the Lake Nona Town Center in Florida. And so our students have been working on that all year and are kind of coming to the end of that competition next month. So we're really excited uh, to see what they come up with. And we also do a couple other types of activities. Uh, we've had an ongoing industry guest lecture series where we're bringing companies to campus to present to our students, to show them, help build those connections between the classroom and the real world. Because that's what it's all about. We're here to train the students so that they can go on and get careers solving these problems uh, in the world. So we've had that. Uh, here are a couple examples of some of our presenters in the past couple of years. We have a STEM for All panel that we had this week. 
to really highlight some kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion issues in engineering, because traditionally engineering has been a field where there are underrepresented groups, and we're working hard to educate our students about those issues so that we can be part of the solution. Going and then we have a couple opportunities for engagement on the capstone projects. Like I already talked about a few examples. So what are some key takeaways? Sorry, again, this ended up a little small. Um, so our degree is unique. It has a multidisciplinary approach to engineering education because that's what it takes in order to prepare graduates to work in this field. So we're trying to prepare uh, graduates in a new way. There's very few schools that are doing this kind of very focused uh, approach. There are lots of opportunities to work with us here right now. So I mentioned a few of them. There's capstone projects, industry lectures, opportunities to look for students for internships or employment. If you're a business that has those needs, we're here, we have students, we'd like to help you connect with them. Uh, guest lectures are also one, one of the things that helps the companies out with that is an opportunity to meet some of those students and see if you can attract. Um, and then also, as I said, we have really outstanding faculty doing high level technical research. And in uh, many cases, we're open to conversations about how we can partner with industry on that research as well, or offer some of our expertise to help solve or develop understanding around this. We're really proud to be part of advancing renewables in PA and training our students as technical experts that hopefully will be able to contribute to these challenges as this energy transition takes place. And most of all, I'm really excited because fun things are happening here and it's great to be part of it. And uh, I love coming to work and helping excite the students about how awesome renewables are. And that's it. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I think I'm gonna stop the share here so I could get our panelists back up. And we are gonna open it up for questions. I'm, I'm gonna um, see what I can do here to maximize this and then uh, get the... All right, anybody um, want to start out with some questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I was just curious. Not, the... Hang on, so everybody could hear you. I mean, in, in, oh. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, my name's Paul. You got to speak right into it. I was just curious if uh, there's an economics portion to that engineering degree. Uh, yeah, for sure. So all students in engineering at Penn State do take an economics class, but in particular for this degree, in those design classes, we have integrated a lot of the life cycle analysis and financing concepts, because as you saw in several of these presentations, that's a big part of uh, making these systems work on a practical basis. Hi, I'm Todd Eaches. I'm with Pure Green Biolag. I'm in an incubator across the street with can at Candy. Uh, we are a startup uh, waste to green hydrogen production company. So our focus is and our work within our consortium is building out uh, infrastructure to not only produce hydrogen, which is what I do, uh, but we're also going to focus on uh, building out infrastructure on highways to be able to deal with long haul trucking. Which is inside my consortium. We have a trucking company called Highland in you know, Rochester, which is building uh, platforms now to run on both uh, battery and free hydrogen. So the, my question is: We have like the industrial guy here. Really grateful for what you're doing on the inside of your business. That it really sounds great. We also have academia. We have folks in the room. I think Ken was here, right? From a Ben Franklin partnership. We have folks here that. Have a macro view of this, but there is no macro view beyond this room. Our community on the east is not taking on the same strategy as our friends in the west. There's a hydrogen hub in Pittsburgh, there's a hydrogen hub in uh, Philadelphia that my company's part of. And in each of those conversations, we talk about solar, we talk about wind, we talk about various colors of hydrogen, we talk about 
logistics, we talk about leadership, and we talk about expansion. That's not happening here in Northeastern Pennsylvania. So as a business person, I take my business elsewhere. My business has been all over the place, but my focus is Pennsylvania. My is in West Hazelwood. So the cool thing about this is that we're all here, but the question is how do we take this beyond this room to our leaders, right? And beyond and engage our students in a conversation about the next generation of decarbonization, which isn't really isn't really understood. I just had a classroom full of STEM students at the incubation center. I gave them a speech on decarbonization. So this is a bigger question for all of us is how do we take this, engage in what you're doing individually, create best practices, and then move them out into the community because we don't have a hub here. And this is without respect. With all due respect to communities that have coal, that are losing their power plants. We lost our power plants here in 1970, but we still have coal lands to fix, just like they do in Ohio and West Virginia and Western Pennsylvania, the bituminous. So again, I say out loud to you all, this is, this is crucially important. Like this is the most important day that I've seen like around here in a while to talk about these things openly and challenge. The carbon attitude that we live in. I grew up in Wilkes-Barre, graduated from Coughlin High School. I was the chairman of the Coal Caucus in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives from 19, I don't know, 98 to whatever. I negotiated the EPS standards in 2004 and 2000, again in 2007. But the, but the renewable standards we have have to take expansion. It has to be biomass to energy. It has to be waste energy is what I do, nuclear to green hydrogen, right? There's all these technologies we can optimize to build a market, but it's a bigger conversation beyond classrooms, beyond boardrooms, and beyond even legislative rooms, because there's politics involved in this, too much. So again, as a startup in the back of the room, I'm in the middle of my raise period, got my MOU side, we have technology, and we're gonna take waste streams, non-recyclables, and turn those into energy. So how that works is working with the community collectively, not for our own particular individual corporate use. This is a broader conversation, just one company. So I just want to build a perspective from the back of the room for somebody who's actually here, who's going to be there. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful. I've stood in rooms with really great people like Secretary Granholm in Washington and uh, folks like Secretary Manchin and, and, the, and the head of the, his wife, the head of the uh, uh, Appalachian Region Commission in, in West Virginia. We got to get our act together here. Beyond our, my own individual interests, I still have a collective interest to make sure we move into this economy right and we benefit from it. This isn't going to be one of those things where just Pittsburgh gets their opportunity. Eastern Pennsylvania has to be represented at the table so we can clean up our mess too. So thanks. Well, let me just ask, Sharon, did, I mean, I'm asking you, did you have any thoughts on that based on your experience kind of working collaboratively with communities and, and organizations out in Western PA that maybe, you know, maybe <laughs> 10 years ago? <laughs> and, and what advice do you have for our region? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I have a, a few thoughts. I'm trying to, so yes, Pittsburgh is trying to be a hydrogen hub with blue hydrogen, with gas, with CCS. And as Aaron mentioned, those aren't financially viable or market ready technologies. So I don't, personally know where that's all going, but it does seem, I would agree on the lack of leadership across the state for all of these technologies. There just seems to be a hyper-focus on blue hydrogen right now. That is um, where we're at. We're at less than 4% renewables in Pennsylvania. So we have a lot, we have a long way to go if we wanna tackle climate change, or move forward um, on this. And so 
I, I kind of see there's a lack of leadership across the state and I don't see that uniquely to Northeast Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, and, you know, maybe an exception in Southeast Philly's doing a lot more of these things, but I don't see that movement really honestly and elsewhere. I do wonder on the hydrogen, maybe Aaron can speak a little better to this. I applaud you for looking at green hydrogen. That's not a conversation. It's not been in the conversation that I hear in Pennsylvania, particularly not here in Pittsburgh. And there are there's a big movement towards green hydrogen, which doesn't need CCS. I mean, there are other technical considerations around that. Um, but what are the econ what are the economics going to be when this all plays out between pink hydrogen, which is new cover, green hydrogen, like whatever is going to become the most economical to produce is probably going to be the way it's going to move. And so then what does it do to those other markets that are building on the less economical hydrogen pathway is a big question that I have. And people don't seem to quite have answers around the economics of business models around any of this yet. So um, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Aaron or someone else has some other thoughts to share. Um, I'm happy to add just a word real quick. You know, I've got presentations on it and I'm not going to, I won't pull up new charts. I've already bored you guys with, with charts and stuff, but um, yeah, we're committed to green hydrogen uh, versus blue or gray. And so just for everybody, what does that mean? Um, you know, other forms of hydrogen, so blue and gray or brown, uh, these are taking fossil fuels and using fossil fuels to produce hydrogen and then perhaps running carbon capture on the back end. Um, our math really, really shows that those are uh, more emissions intensive than simply burning the gas to begin with. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to share data with anyone that's interested, but, but it's just better just to burn gas or burn coal than to make hydrogen uh, with coal or gas. Uh, it's just it's just more emissions intensive. So the only way that, that hydrogen makes sense to me is if it's renewable and clean and green. Um, it is, however, much more expensive to do that. So 96% of the hydrogen produced in the United States today is coming from uh, primarily from, from natural gas and petroleum. Uh, and the, the reason that is is because uh, green hydrogen is, is really expensive right now. So... I think it's a it's an R and D state space, and I think we'll you know continue to work towards it and um, you know stay engaged. But it is it is not cost effective at this point. So good afternoon, everyone. First of all, let me thank all the speakers. It was great. Uh, my question is going to be for Aaron, but first, congratulations to all the Penn State professors for the multidisciplinary program. I think it's unique. I think it's different, and I think it's really amazing. So congratulations to all of you. Karen, I, I, I have to admit, I was looking for Pennsylvania universities and colleges and the slides. Um, and I saw a lot of Kentucky and I heard a lot of Kentucky, maybe building on what Todd was talking about in the back. What can we be doing in Pennsylvania, maybe compared to Kentucky or what, what's Kentucky doing so well that Pennsylvania needs to build on? Because it sure seems like you guys were doing some great stuff there. How do we do that great stuff here? That's a great question. Um, and let me tell you, you know, the reason that I got this job was because our CEO said to me, he called me and said, you all did great in Kentucky. Now come do that here. So that is my goal. And in fact, um, you know, there was a comment, uh, people who are actually there, you know, I, I spent, I spent uh, weeks and weeks. I spent probably 75% uh, of last month in Pennsylvania. Um, I was at a couple different Penn State campuses. Um, I met with a meeting with faculty all across Pennsylvania, and we're doing that right now. We're trying to put together research teams that are going to go after these federal dollars. So we, we PPL, uh, you know, I manage millions in, in R&D funding, and, and I, I will be channeling uh, that towards supporting local universities. But that's not really how we move the needle. How we move the needle is that we go together after a very large federal grant. And that grant go to pay for research work done in Pennsylvania. That's the goal. That's why I was, that's why I was really brought to Pennsylvania to do exactly that. Um, I think if we have this conversation in a year, 
I think there's going to be a slide deck full of really awesome university projects in Pennsylvania. That is the goal. And uh, if that's not the case, then, then I've certainly, I've certainly failed us. And if I could just add, we do have a lot. We do already have a lot of projects. Um, Penn State has a seven, as in when you now have a 70 megawatt project. Um, they built another two megawatt that's right there outside of the campus. We, we've got Solar Shepherds at Susquehanna University. There's a number of universities. Uh, Pitt is building, um, uh, they have a virtual power purchase agreement with the 30 megawatt. Um, set, We've got a number of examples, and I think we have a lot more solar probably than Kentucky does. I think online. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. We have over we have forty thousand solar owners in Pennsylvania. Most of that's residential, and we're seeing a big uptick in the commercial side, and also the expansion of utility scale. And because Pennsylvania is the largest land state in PJM territory, it is a, a high focus for development of solar. Um, and there's about, there's over 23 gigawatts of solar in the PJM queue. That's utility scale solar that's in the planning queue. Now, a large portion of that won't get built, but that's a, that's, if all that were to get, if half of that were to get built, that's over 10% of our solar, of our energy in Pennsylvania electricity. So I have to say, there's a lot of really great stuff that's happening. We're seeing businesses municipalities, Philadelphia has a 70 megawatt project that they've um, commissioned uh, as well. So we are seeing this expansion and Center County um, also is doing a lot. So we are seeing a lot of movement in Pennsylvania. So I don't, I wanna make sure that people have the right <laughs> impression about some of that. Thanks, thanks for saying that. Yeah, uh, hi, my name is Brian Hiller. I'm with the Sustainable Energy Fund. Uh, we, uh, Nonprofit in Pennsylvania, we administer a CBH program as well as uh, a number of other things. Um, I graduated with Penn State. Uh, I was under a technical aspect. My major was actually energy and sustainability policy, um, but I think the policy components complement the technical aspect as well. Um, I, I forgot to give you a I apologize. That's Todd. Todd, um, it's your ad to, to your point, especially about the positive sense that I think we're. I don't want to use the word cursed, but you know we had so much natural gas in the state that, that it, it, it it does become political, and, and there are you know, there are too many uh, stakeholders and too many interests that that really kind of burden this debate. But I, I think that one of the one of the things I found mildly successful is I think some, sometimes this debate becomes the conversation becomes a dichotomy where it's like renewables versus fossils and so forth. And I think that you know, this past year that we've seen, especially with what natural gas has done. On a global perspective, that it doesn't have to be that way. That we can still look to invest in, in renewable energy efficiency because we're losing, if we're using less natural gas. It's just being shipped off to another you know, another country, which is benefiting them greatly as well. Um, so it, it's still a commodity that we can introduce and invest in ourselves. But um, you know, it, we don't have to necessarily you know demonize natural gas yet, even if it's still you know, greenhouse gas. But I, I think that's what what happens sometimes, and yeah. what. That's the opportunity I see to try to change that conversation. It, it doesn't have to be one or the other. I think it can be both. It's all. Um, but I, I would like to compliment and, and applaud uh, um, uh, some of the remarks of uh, uh, logistics for the approach and uh, you know, what you've done to, to do, produce your own footprint, make yourself more sustainable. And I wanted to ask you, Michael, what 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 kind of obstacles did you see both, you know, either your mindset, your approach? Um, or, or even just logistically or technically, what kind of obstacles do you guys have to overcome? And what could that be used to other parts of the industry, which maybe you might be more resistant to these kinds of things? Yeah, sure. But that's a, a good question. You know, it kind of goes back to Joan's comment. In fact, you know, listen, doing, doing the right thing has never been. The market shorts for the human eye and not the news for us as people. These conversations, this willingness, it's hard. Um, there's some discomfort in the conversations about these investments uh, on, a, on a global scale. Um, I think the great thing, oh, at least we've seen 
uh, as a company over the last 10, 15 years. Is that at least we're having these conversations, but they're not operating the funnel. And I can I can clearly say that 10, 15 years ago, we were operating, you know, in a very small, uh, small way uh, in a funnel with us and the suppliers and just really us reaching out to the industry and looking for things that we wanted to accomplish. And we had challenges. We had sites uh, historically that are right next to FAA-controlled airports. And how do you push for solar and reflectiveness when pilots are landing and taking off uh, right next to these sites? So we, we've dealt with it. Um, I would say that these conversations are critical, bringing together different areas of community. Um, you know, the public, the, the utility providers, uh, you know, grants uh, and underwriting focus programs that are looking at how to apply uh, technical resources and knowledge uh, and also the financial uh, element to uh, pushing businesses and, and people to make these decisions. But, you know, if I could say one thing, it's really this talk is good. Um, we, we have the opportunity. Um, you know, I'm uh, 33 years old. I've seen a lot of change over the course of my life in terms of the importance of, of this earth and a lot of decisions that have been made over the last 100 years to get us to where we are. We didn't get here overnight. Uh, we're not going to get out of this overnight. Uh, but as long as we're making conscious effort each day and working on education programs like Penn State to train young minds about the world that we want to become and the world we need to get back to, um, I think we're well on our way to driving a successful solution uh, for bringing the economy. I have a comfortable conversation about that with them. I guess that's what it is. Yeah, listen, I have uncomfortable conversations. Um, you know, uncomfortable conversations about legacy mindset, uncomfortable conversations about cost. These these are real truths, and it's it's an investment to protect the earth. Uh, by you know. Uh, Something that my my mother was sitting there and sort of said to me, you know, she wanted to go to a better world for her kids than she had growing up. And part of that is this earth that we live on. And I have to do my job. You have to do your job. Everyone in this room and planet has to do their job to make sure that we're doing that for our children, our grandchildren, future generations. Because if those conversations are not happening, we're going nowhere. We're just continuing on the path of history. Um, that's going to lead us into the dark. Okay, well, maybe one last question. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> you guys. Dr. and Allie, what is your favorite part of teaching at Penn State? Thank you, Sydney. So uh, the person asking this question is Sydney, who's one of our senior students and is working on our senior design program. Um, so honestly, I've always wanted to be a college professor since I was a college student. And so being here and getting to work with the students every day and especially teaching about something that I feel is important, as several of these conversations have highlighted, this topic, I think, is really an important topic for us all to be addressing. It is important not just for getting students jobs and helping people to have a good life, which I believe is important too, but I believe this is an important topic for the future of the world. And I'm glad to be doing even a small part and helping you all to hopefully have a vision to do a part in that as well. So that's what I, I like to say. Well, that was a good question and a great answer, and I think we'll end on, on that high note. Um, I just want to thank everybody again, uh, whether you're here in person or virtually, for participating today. I think to Todd's question, you know, what can we do as a region? I I know that there are um, programs at Penn State through the Sustainability Institute. The uh, Local Climate Action Planning is one, just one of, of several um, programs, you know, Extension maybe has others. Uh, if anybody's interested in learning more, please reach out to me, uh, the faculty, anybody who ne needs contact information on any of the speakers, I have it, you know, feel free to reach out and um, thank you again. Have a great, have a great night. One last question. Sorry. Uh, 
I was patiently waiting, and then you said no more questions. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, Aaron and Michael, this is specifically for you. Um, how could Penn State students, specifically at Penn State Hinton, increase their value to companies like PPL and Romark, Romark Logistics, combined with our degree to secure jobs for future graduates, prepare them to take on the jobs and fulfill your needs as companies? I'm happy to take a first stab at answering that. Um, Guys, we are we are hiring um, as fast as possible. Uh, we need we need people. We need we need electricians. We need electrical engineers. We need chemical engineers, mechanical engineers. Um, I would encourage you to go to uh, pplweb.com and go to the, the careers page, and, and and you can see really the the skill sets that we're looking for. Um, we're we're hiring as fast as we can. Um, what what can people do better? You know, generically. I like to encourage candidates and students to be to be diverse. And what I mean there is, you know, rather than have, say, you know, just focused in one area, say, for example, you know, I meet I meet an engineer who is just focused in one area of engineering and doesn't have, say, uh, data analytics or programming skills. I think the best candidates that I see that are uh, super, super valuable are ones that bring multiple disciplines together into one and that might be a humanity or it may be you know like i said data science or um programming and then combine that with some other technical skill those are the candidates that i see going the furthest um particularly you know if you have you know soft skills people skills etc um you know one of the best one of the best phds i i ever had working for me he was he was an engineer he also did his doctorate and he also was an electrician. And he, he was just such a remarkable person because, you know, not only could he do the, to do the book work, but he could actually get on the ladder and actually go fix it, actually go do it. Um, so such a, just such a remarkable combination of skills. And so that's what I encourage all students is, is really to not just pick one thing, but try to pick two things. And as your career changes, and maybe as the industry changes, you might lean more towards one. You might, you might be more of a data scientist in part of your career, and you might be more of an engineer in another part of your career. But I would, I would have multiple skill sets that make you stand out uh, in a list of applicants. All right. <laughs> Thank you again, Aaron and Michael.